who were not offenders. Om Ajnana Timaranda Sankyananjana Shalakaya Tatsur Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Panchakalpataru Yasya Kripa Sindhu Yalevacha Patitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Jimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Dhinamine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Prachadine Nirvisesha Shunyavani Paschakradesha Thadine Panchani Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're hearing about the Dhruva Maharaj's activities. Dhruva Maharaj had become the king. Maharaj Uttanapada had saw that Dhruva Maharaj was now sufficiently mature and that he was also greatly respected and loved by all the citizens. So Uttanapada retired and gave the throne to Dhruva <coughs> Maharaj. But it happened that one time his brother Uttama had gone to the forest and was killed by a yaksha. So when his brother was killed by a yaksha, then Dhruva Maharaj made war against the yakshas. And we heard how he attacked Alakapuri, which is the capital of the yakshas. And a great battle was taking place. The yakshas had magical powers and they used their different magical powers also in fighting Dhruva Maharaj. Of course, Dhruva Maharaj had very special powers also because he had been given powers by the grace of the Lord. Lord Narayan had even given an arrow to him. So Dhruva Maharaj was able to defeat the Yakshas and he was able to fight with them and kill thousands of them. So now what happened is that Swayambhuvamano saw how Dhruva Maharaj was killing so many yakshas. Swayambhuvamano is the grandfather. Swayambhuvamano is one of the sons of Brahma. And Swayambhuvamano had two sons. There was Priyavrata and Uttanapada. There were also three daughters. Devahuti was one, then Prachuti and uh, Akuti. Akuti, Devahuti and Prach Prashuti, the three daughters of Swayambhuvamanu. So, Dhruva Maharaj is the son of Uttanapada. Uttama was also son of Uttanapada. As you know, Uttanapada had the two wives. Suniti and Saruchi. So it was Dhruva Maharaj who became the king. And when Uttama was killed, then Dhruva Maharaj thought it took it as his duty to make war against the Yakshas. And he killed many of wholesale. This Prabhupada uses the word wholesale, I mean big numbers. He was killing them. So Swayambhuvamano was feeling compassion for them. Out of great compassion he approached Dhruva Maharaj. Manu is one of the Mahajans, right? The twelve Mahajans, the authorities on devotional service. And Manu naturally has compassion for these Yakshas because he knows they are also living entities. So a devotee the Lord will see the Lord in all living entities. 
Just like one time, uh, Prabhupada was staying in Mumbai, a Juhu. Juhu temple is by the beach, and there's always a lot of mosquitoes there. So uh, the devotee was he put up Prabhupada's net, and then he started to kill different mosquitoes, you know. The mosquitoes were in Prabhupada's room, and the devotee was killing them. But Prabhupada said to me, said, don't turn my room into a crematorium. <laughs> so Prabhupada respected all forms of life, even in the mosquito. And you can read in the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, it describes different kinds of hell. And there's a hell for people who kill little insects. If you kill things like bed bugs and so on like that, there's a special hell where you have to go and you have to be bitten by all kinds of bugs there because you kill all these insects. So we have to be very conscious about everything we do. We should understand there's always reactions for the different activities which we perform. So Dhruva Maharaj, was, as a ruler, he was thinking that it was his duty to go and get revenge on the Yakshas. He thought, my brother has been killed, I have to take revenge. Otherwise, they'll think they'll get away with it any time. They think they can just kill our people any time they want. So Dhruva Maharaj took action against them. but. His action became excessive. Swanabhuva Mano became concerned that there was no end to it. Because once you start fighting, then the fight goes on and on and on. It never wants to stop. And so you get these kind of situations just like you've got, you know, Russia and Ukraine, you know, the war is still going on, you know, after such a long time. They're still fighting. They, they never want to stop. And so it got like that, the, the, the same situation was there with Dhruva Maharaj and the Yakshas. It seemed like there was no end to their war. And so Swami Bhuvamanu was coming to give instruction to Dhruva Maharaj to request him not to be so much violent. So non-violence, of course, is something which the Buddhists promote a lot. The emperor, Buddhism was spread through India by one emperor, Ashok, and he promoted the Buddhist because and this emperor, Ashok, was so affected by seeing the death of so many people in battle. He saw, had seen so many people killed, he saw so many people suffering from all the miseries inflicted by the wars which they had been taking part in. And he felt so bad about it that when he heard the Buddhist philosophy about nonviolence, that he also took up that Buddhist philosophy and promoted it everywhere. So we should understand the Buddhist teaching it's not an internal religion. It's a, it's a temporary philosophy. It was a temporary measure. And the, Buddha, the teachings of the Buddha are not an internal religion. It's just, it was due to the emergency situation which arose. Of course, at the time of the Buddha, that, kind, that time the problem was the violence to the animal killing the animals in sacrifice. And that is described in the prayers of Jayadeva Goswami in the Das Avatars, where he is listed Lord Buddha there as one of the avatars. And he describes how, because the, the Brahmanas of, they were killing so many animals, so the Lord came in the form of Buddha and propagated this uh, teaching of the Buddha. And what is that teaching of the Buddha? They, they simply teach that everything is 
unreal. Nothing is real. Nothing is real. <laughs> that is their teaching. That you don't exist and the world doesn't exist and you don't do anything. And so they just uh, promote this idea. And of course they, they say that the ultimate principle of religion is ahimsa. And they promote this ahimsa, non-violence. And there are different extremes by which people will go to, to practice Ahimsa. You've got groups like the Jain people, and the Jain people, they will sweep the road wherever they walk. They will sweep the road so they don't walk on any insects. And they will wear a mask over their face all the time. And all the water they drink will be filtered in case there's any living entities there in the water. And they won't eat anything which grows below the ground. And they will wear cloth, they will wear ahimsa silk. You can get a special silk cloth which is made from ahimsa, it's called ahimsa silk. And they will wait till the silkworm dies naturally before they take the cocoon. Usually when they make silk, they'll kill the silkworm and take the cocoon. But ahimsa silk is where they wait for the silkworm to die and then they take the silk, the cocoon from the worm. So that is the ahimsa silk. So like that, you go to great extremes to practice non violence but that is not the ultimate principle of religion. It's a good quality. We don't argue it's a good thing, non-violent, very good, but it's not the highest principle of religion. And to understand what is the highest principle of religion, that is why Lord Krishna himself comes to this world to teach, to speak the Bhagavad Gita, and to explain about Sanatana Dharma. So, Swayam Bhupamana felt compassion. He didn't want to... He, his grandson, uh, so, uh, so violent and responsible for the deaths of so many yakshas. Grandfather is more merciful than the father. Prabhupada used to say to us, he say, he said, I am very strict with you, but Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he is your spiritual grandfather, he will be more kind. The duty of the father is to be strict, but the grandfather, he will be kind. And so Prabhupada is telling us like that, that the grandfather is more merciful than the father. So here we see Swayam Bhuvamanu also getting mercy from his grandfather. Uh, rather, Dhruva Maharaj getting mercy from the grandfather Swayam Bhuvamanu. So Manu is going to explain to Dhruva Maharaj that he should stop all of this killing. Now we see in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna encourages Arjuna to kill. But that's a very different situation. Arjuna fighting on the battlefield Kurukshetra, that is a religious war. That the Kurus and the, well, they're all Kurus, the Kurus and the Pandavas, they come to fight and they both got their supporters. And they're all Kshatriyas. So they've come as Kshatriyas to fight. And Kshatriyas are happy to fight and to die on the battlefield. That is glorious for them, to die on the battlefield. Uh, the Kshatriya knows that if he dies on the battlefield, then he will go to heaven. Or you and of course, if they, if they die actually seeing Krishna and in the presence of Krishna, then they can actually go to the spiritual world. 
And even without Krishna's presence, just simply as Kshatriyas, they will be let go to the heavenly planets and enjoy there. So for the Kshatriya, that's a glorious death. It is said there are two types of death are glorious. One is to die on the battlefield and the other is to die in Samadhi with the mind based on the Supreme Lord. So, you know, we're going to die. Those are good ways to die. Mm -hmm. Go on the battle, out on the battlefield. And uh, devotees used to say to Srila Prabhupada like that, that we want to take you back to America, Prabhupada. And, and, and they quoted the verse from the Bhagavad Gita where Lord Krishna is telling Arjuna about dying on the battlefield, how it is glorious. So the devotee said, Prabhupada, we will take you back to America and you can die on the battlefield. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, yes, I want that benediction. I want to die on the battlefield. And so, uh, dying on the battlefield is good, but it has to be the right situation. Here, uh, Chwambhubamana concluded that there was no need for such violence on the part of Dhruva Maharaj. That there should be the proper reasons behind the war taking place, just like in Kurukshetra, they had tried everything to avoid the battle, but ultimately they could not. That Duryodhan and his brothers were all determined that there has to be war. We have to fight. We cannot live. So long as the Pandavas are here, we cannot properly rule the kingdom. And so they, had, they insisted there had to be war against the Pandavas. Although Yudhisthira had even sent Lord Krishna to go and meet Dhritarashtra and try to convince Dhritarashtra to stop the war, to stop his sons, but it was a failure. That Duryodhan was insistent that there must be war. There must, we must have this war. They didn't want any kind of compromise. And, and even though they made so many attempts, they had to have the war. So they, they went to war. And Lord Krishna, of course, Arjuna, he had his doubts in the middle of the battlefield. He had his doubts about fighting. He had his reasons. And that, of course, is the subject matter of the Bhagavad Gita. That Arjuna is questioning to Krishna that I don't think it's right. It's not right, and I had his reasons, and the reasons that I'm going to suffer sinful reactions for fighting, and uh, I'm going to, I won't enjoy the kingdom, and it's not compassionate, and it's going to destroy the dynasty, and if the dynasty is destroyed, then there'll be degradation, and there'll be unwanted progeny, and in this way, Arjuna had so many reasons, he said, I'm not convinced myself it's necessary to fight. So Arjuna couldn't make up his mind if he should fight or not. And he had all of these doubts. But Lord Krishna said no. Lord Krishna defeated all of Arjuna's arguments. And then at the end, you can see in the Bhagavad Gita, 18th chapter, Lord Krishna is saying to Arjuna, he said, now you decide, what are you going to do? So Lord Krishna ultimately left the decision to Arjuna to decide, are you going to fight or not? And so Arjuna had to, Arjuna said, yeah, now I've, I've, I've heard your instructions and I'm convinced and I'm ready to act. And Srila Prabhupada writes in the purport, he said that, Lord Krishna was ready to speak the whole Bhagavad Gita again to Arjuna. If Arjuna had any doubts or any problems about it, Lord Krishna was willing to go through the whole teachings of the Gita again, just to make it very clear to Arjuna that what he was doing was right. 
So this was the battle of Kurukshetra. And of course, millions of people also died at the Kurukshetra war. It was not a small war, it was a big war, and a lot of people died. But it was necessary because Mother Earth was burdened. She was overburdened by all of the demonic Kshatriyas. And that was one of the reasons why Lord Krishna had appeared. That Mother Bhumi had gone to appeal to Lord Brahma for help because their whole planet was overburdened by all the demonic Kshatriyas. And then Lord Brahma had prayed to uh, Lord Vishnu in Sweta Dweep and the Lord of Sweta Dweep had replied into the mind of Brahma that everyone should take birth in the Yadu dynasty and the Lord was also going to come in the Yadu dynasty. And so in this way, everyone felt uh, pacified and they all waited for the Lord to appear. So the Lord came and he really relieved the earth of many different demons. We know from Krishna Leela how Krishna killed many different demons. Jarasandha was killed by Bhima and then people like Dantavarka and Sishupala they were killed by Lord Krishna and Kamsa was killed by Lord Krishna. But there were still many, many demons, many Kshatriyas who were overburdening the earth. And so it was arranged to bring them all together at Kurukshetra and they could kill each other. And in this way the earth would be relieved of the burden. And later on, of course, you have the you have the fratricidal war between the members of the Yadu dynasty, because the Yadu dynasty are also burdening the earth. They are also a great burden, and Lord Krishna knows that the members of the Yadu dynasty they cannot maintain their life without Lord Krishna, and Lord Krishna was preparing himself to depart from the world. So Lord Krishna arranged that the Yadu dynasty, they would also have to leave the world before him, that they should all go before he departs. So the members of the Yadu dynasty, they all went to Prabhakshetra and there they were drinking some kind of wine and they all became intoxicated and then they fought with each other and they killed each other. So in this way, the Yadu dynasty was also removed from the earth. Nobody else could fight the Yadu dynasty. They were so powerful, nobody could equal them. So they had to fight each other and kill each other and remove each other from the earth. So you can see different incidents of violence being described where there's specific purposes in mind and where there's no other alternative. But here, in the case of Dhruva Maharaj, it was an isolated incident. Now the Pandavas, they had suffered many atrocities before the battle of Kurukshetra. So many incidents were there. Their house had been set on fire, they were living in the Shellac house, it all got set on fire. And then Bhima had been given poison in, their fo in the food. And then, uh, then Drupadi was lost in the gambling match and the attempt was made to disrobe her. And then the Pandavas were sent into exile for 12 years. In they had to be incognito for one year. So many different atrocities, they, they were injustices were committed against the Pandavas. And they tolerated all these things. But then finally it came to the point that the Pandavas, as Kshatriyas, they need to have some kingdom to rule. But the Kurus were saying, 
we will not give enough land to go through the eye of a needle. We're not even, there's no question of giving you a village. We will not even give enough land to go through the eye of a needle. So in this way, they refuse to give any land at all to the Pandavas. So the Pandavas were forced that there had to be war. And the Kauras wanted war. And they didn't want to make peace at all. And so in this way, great violence took place. Many, many people died at Kurukshitra war. But it relieved the earth of the burden of all of the demonic kings. But here in Dhruva Maharaj's case, it was just a one, one incident that some yaksha had killed the brother of Dhruva Maharaj. So Dhruva Maharaj had, maybe you could say he overreacted, but he considered his action necessary in order to properly let the yakshas know that he's there and that he's powerful and he's ready to fight them. But anyway, now Swayam Bhuvamana has come and he's going to pacify Dhruva Maharaj. He's going to speak instructions on, he'll warn him about the danger of anger and uncontrolling, when, when the anger is not controlled, then it's very dangerous to a person's uh, mental condition and they can behave in very wrong ways. So this is what's going to be explained in the coming section of Srimad Bhagavatam. Dhruva Maharaj is going to warn, or rather Swami is going to warn Dhruva about the dangers of anger and not controlling that anger properly. And how Dhruva Maharaj had been excessive in trying to punish all the yakshas, but only one yaksha did something wrong. Well, and because of the wrong of one yaksha, a whole war is declared against all the yakshas. So this, of course, this is a very wrong way in which we, we to behave. That you judge someone, oh, that person did like that. So all the people were like, they're all like him. We cannot make those kind of uh, judgments against people. Oh, what, one African did this. Oh, so all Africans are like that. No, you cannot say like that. It's not fair. Everywhere there are good and bad people. And so the good people have to be recognized. You can't think, oh, because this one person is bad, so all people are bad. That is not proper logic. So Dhruva Maharaj is going to be put in, it's going to be brought to his senses. You could say he's going to be controlled by the instructions of Swami Bhuva Mana. Are there any questions? Any comments? Yes. Could uh, Duru Maharaj act was to satisfy his stepmother Suruchi? <laughs> what? Could Duru Maharaj such act be? Could uh, Duru Maharaj this act uh, maybe to pacify his stepmother Suruchi? Well, he didn't get the opportunity because when, when Uttama got killed, Uttama was the son of Suruchi. So when Suruchi heard that her son had been killed, she went to look for her son. She was so deeply attached to her son that she went off into the forest in search of her son. So Dhruva Maharaj didn't get the opportunity to pacify Suruchi. But he, he could have, if he, but it just so happened that the Saruchi went off. So 
suddenly that Dhruva Maharaj was not able to save her. Thank you, Maharaj. Krishna Mai. Maharaj, thank you for your time. Uh, Maharaj, this mosquito, is, uh, they carry malaria and dengue, and malaria has been eradicated. Now my question is, during Prabhupada's time, was malaria prevalent? Yes, of course. Yeah, in Prabhupada's time, malaria was there a lot. Now, Something worse has come. <laughs> huh? After malaria, you got dengue. Dengue is worse than malaria. Malaria is a, a parasite. Dengue is a... It, it's, it's not a parasite, it's a, a virus or something. It's different from malaria. But it's worse. Covid also kills and killed five million people. Some have a license to kill all these animals. My, my next question is: um, Prabhupada says we have to think of Krishna for twenty-four hours of the day. How do I do it, Maharaj? How do you do it? Well, Lord Chaitanya said, "Kirtani Asana Hari." Always chant the holy name. You want to think of Krishna? If you're chanting the holy name, then you're thinking of Krishna. So you have many rounds to chant every day. So that way you'll be able to think of Krishna. Keep chanting. You have Prabhupada's books to read. Read Prabhupada's books every day. You read Prabhupada's books and you chant Hare Krishna, you think of Krishna all day. I know, but when we are asleep, we are like comatose, you know. <laughs> well, if the whole day you're reading and chanting and hearing about Krishna, though when you sleep at night, you'll dream about Krishna. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Well, you have to understand, they were Kshatriyas and it was not Kali Yuga. These principles are for people in the Kali Yuga. Before the Kali Yuga had begun, the Yadus were there and the Yadus were Kshatriyas. So for the Kshatriyas to do these things, that is common. The, the Kshatriya people, just like they gamble with each other, you say, we, oh, we shouldn't gamble. But because they're Kshatriyas, they have a duty. If they're challenged, they have to take the challenge. The Pandavas were challenged to dice. And sometimes Krishna, Balaram was, Balaram was challenged to a game of dice by Rukmi. When you're challenged, you, you, you can't refuse. Not good, doesn't look good if you refuse the challenge. And so, drinking wine is one of the habits of the Kshatriyas. Just like they go hunting. They go hunting to practice killing. Maharaj Parikshit went hunting. And you go hunt, they have to hunt the wild animals because there are wild animals. And so the Kshatriyas will go in the jungle, they'll hunt the wild animals. 
So this is part of, you may say, oh, this is killing. But it's Shakya duty. And so drinking wine is also another part of the Shakya culture. That they do these things, they drink wine. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Guru Maharaj, uh, sometimes I kill insects and they come. <laughs> I try my best not to, but then they do come and to make it up, sort of, I sometimes chant Hare Krishna when I kill the insects. And, and I don't know, is there any way, anything that one can do as a prayer chitta? And, and I can't say that I can't stop killing them because I'm mortally uh, I, I can't stand certain insects. It's either I live in that house or the insect lives in that house, like cockroach. So it's very difficult. And, and so it comes not all the time, but once in a while. So I don't know what to do. Well, you definitely want to be more conscious that these are living entities. Um, if there were cockroaches, Prabhupada would simply throw it out the window and say, go outside and enjoy. And so you, you could do that, you know. Don't, don't come in here to enjoy, go outside. <laughs> Put a notice up. <laughs> no mosquitoes, no cockroaches, go outside. Yeah. We have to understand these are living entities. Prabhupada's father had a cloth business and his cloth business was in a part of Calcutta, Barapaza. It's an old part of the city. There's a lot of rats. You know Calcutta? You know Calcutta, they're, they're big rats here in Calcutta. So he had a cloth business and the rats will eat cloth. So Prabhupada's father, every night, he would put out a bowl of rice. He'd put out a bowl of rice and the rats will come, they'll eat the rice, they won't eat the cloth. So he, he would do like that. He rather didn't put any poison or anything there. One time in Hyderabad, a uh, devotee, there was a, a problem with the rats coming and they were eating different boga and so on. And the devotee said to Prabhupada, can we kill them Prabhupada? And Prabhupada said, you should be killed. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, these creatures come. kingdom, their domain. You put your house where these roaches were originally, maybe they were there before you, you know, but you built your house on top of the roaches, so the roaches have also come to live in your house. What can you do about it? But definitely we don't want to, we don't encourage killing in these creatures. But if they attack you, just like a mosquito, if it's biting you, then you can kill it. Then um, that's self-defense. If they're attacking you, you have to wait for them to attack you. <laughs> and then you can kill it. Guru Maharaj, also another question. Um, like we see the story of Mrigari, the hunter, uh, after he was, uh, after he became a devotee, he would step carefully and avoid ants. And this is an example of Ahimsa. And uh, also you were saying that the Buddhists and the Jains, how they would go so much out of their way for Ahimsa. So in, in practically in our, practically, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Find it and bring oh. Hare, Hare Krishna, it's on.
Hare Krishna. So practically, um, the question is how to understand where to draw the line between the principle of Ahimsa and like uh, and also maybe other higher principles. So we, we as devotees, we don't follow what the Jains do. We eat vegetables which grow under the ground. So like that, how do we know where to draw the line? Well, what is for Krishna's service and what is for your sense gratification? For the service of Krishna, sometimes we'll have to do things, we'll have to kill some living entities. Sometimes, just like you're driving your car and walking around, doing things, moving places, sometimes you will, you know, not intentionally, but some things that will happen, the different living entities are going to be killed. But, you're moving for the service of Krishna. And so if it's for the service of Krishna, there's no reaction. But if we're simply acting for our own sense gratification, then you get some reaction. So it's, if it's karma yoga, there's no reaction. If you're working for Krishna, everything is dedicated for the service of Krishna, then even though some living entities may be harmed or killed even, but because it's for the service of Krishna, it's transcendental. There's no reaction. So that is, that is spiritual. But if we're just simply doing things on our own behalf, for our own sense gratification, then there will be karma. Krishna Maharaj, one question. You know, what about you using these uh, mosquito sprays, insecticide sprays, you know? When you see a lot of ants on the floor, you sweep it, they still come back. There is a reason for them to come. But what is the reason for them to come? Well, this was their home. They used to be here, you see. So, but you build this temple on top of their home. <laughs> Is it, is it sinful to use the spray? Well, that's wrong. Well, usually what we would use is eucalyptus. You get eucalyptus oil. Oh, yeah. You put eucalyptus oil and then it's usually quite effective. Just repel them. Huh? Just repel them. Yeah. Maharaj, it's one should not kill a poisonous snake because the poison is medicine for a snake bite. It's just common. The poison is medicine for? Snake bite. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. And yet, Maharaj, <coughs> when you are in danger to defend, to protect, then we can make it, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Not simply. Yeah. You have to consider the circumstances. Guru Maharaj, was Uttanapada in Maya when he was killing all these uh, yakshas? Uttanapada? Yes. He's not killing. Sorry, sorry. Um, Dhruva. Dhruva, yes. Was he in Maya? Well, he was thinking it's his duty as a Kshatriya, as a king. His duty as a Kshatriya to defend his kingdom. So he was taking that action as a precaution to defend his, his own kingdom. I got one personal question to you. Uh, I understand that you spent time with Prabhupada. Uh, what was the value of anything that you personally want to copy or follow from Prabhupada? You know, when you're spending your time, your young age with Prabhupada, you could have uh, kind of uh, attracted or thought, I also want to be like Prabhupada in this, this matters. Was that anything or the whole thing? How you um, try to make yourself become more elevated, I don't know whether I'm putting the right word, by associating with Prabhupada. Oh, that quality and many qualities. What qualities of Prabhupada? Which 
inspired. Ah, yeah, inspired. Well, Prabhupada has all the qualities of the pure devotee. You know, there's a very nice uh, presentation of the 26 qualities of the pure devotee. And it's put on the internet, you know. Every Ikarasi they did it. Uh, 26 qualities of the pure devotee. And seeing Srila Prabhupada. And they have the different devotees all speaking about different events which took place, how Prabhupada displayed each and every one of these 26 qualities. So you should look at that and you can hear from many devotees about each of the 26 qualities which are there in the pure devotee and how Srila Prabhupada displayed these qualities. You personally, it's your uh, person. Well, well what, why any one quality has to be there, but all the qualities are All the 26 qualities are attractive. Not simply any one quality more than others, but, you know, all, that in the pure devotee we see all the good qualities. Not a question of just one quality inspiring, but we see everything is very proper. Everything is very nice and very satisfying. We don't see faults. We didn't see any fault in Prabhupada. <laughs> Can I say something, Maharaj? <coughs> I have I posed this question to Maharaj way back around 10 or 10 years back and uh, shall I share it Maharaj? <laughs> the, the term Maharaj used was Prabhupada looked, looked very reverent. Reverent. <laughs> reverent. This was the answer given by Maharaj <laughs> long ago. Thank you Maharaj. <laughs> Animals die natural death. At the same time, animals are killed by humans. When they die natural death, will they get uh, uh, will they elevated to the next level? But if the animals are killed by humans, will they retain the same body or they are being elevated? Yeah, when they're killed by the demons, then they have to come back again and take birth in that same kind of body because they have to finish off their karma in that particular body. So they have to take birth again. That's, one of, that's why it's very wrong to kill the animals like that because they have to take birth again to finish off their karma in that particular species before they can be elevated. So, like, likewise, the chickens are very unfortunate because they are being killed almost every day. So forever they remain as a chicken. <laughs> the chickens, yes. Well, the chicken eaters are coming as chickens to be killed. Because they like chickens so much, so they come as chickens. Krishna, yes. Uh, mentioning about the Sakriti when the Devas can approach Vishnu. That is within this universe. Yes, yes, the, led by Brahma, they went to meet Krishna. Uh -huh. they, they petitioned Krishna to come. Where was it? Where was it? Well, uh, Mother Bhumi went to meet Lord Brahma. They went to the shore of the milk ocean. The shore of the milk ocean. 
and on the shore of the milk ocean, within that milk ocean, there is Sweta Dweep. The Sweta Dweep is the island in the middle of the milk ocean. So they went to the shore of the milk ocean. Right? So, Lord Brahma and all the demigods, they went to the shore of the milk ocean. They're not actually able to go into the ocean but we went to the shore of the milk ocean. So this is within the universe? Uh, this universe? Yeah, within the universe, there are different oceans, right? There's an ocean of milk, there's an ocean of sugar cane juice, ocean of ghee. So they went to the shore of the milk ocean to communicate to Lord Vishnu. You have to read the fifth canto and then there's a description about these different oceans which are there. Who would, somebody was giving class last week or before, they were talking about the alcohol there's an ocean of alcohol. Who, who gave that class? Somebody was talking. I wasn't there, but somebody told me how the Woody had given the class here and they were talking about how the scientists had discovered that there was alcohol in the atmosphere. And so where did the alcohol come? How did it get in the atmosphere? Because there's an ocean, there's an, al an ocean of alcohol also. There's different oceans, and one of the oceans is alcohol. So there's many things we don't know about the universe which are told in the Srimad Bhagavatam. We have very limited knowledge of the universe. But in the Srimad Bhagavatam there's a lot of information. So we're trying to try to give this information. Of course, the scientists and the, they're very empirical. They want evidence. They can't see these things. It's difficult for them to accept. It's not enough for them that we can say, "Oh, this is in the Srimad Bhagavatam." They don't accept shastra. They want empirical evidence. They want everything should be measurable. So we don't have that kind of proof yet, but gradually. Gradually one day more and more evidence will be available to prove these things. Just like, you know, that the, the moon further away than the sun. So. They say, oh well, when, when they go to the moon again, then they'll find out that the Americans really go to the moon. But, you know, so far nobody's gone again. But maybe in the future, it will happen. But for us, we're happy just to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. We can accept, we have faith in the message of the Bhagavatam. We just simply hear from the Bhagavatam and accept. We don't doubt these things. Uh, 
Umraj, um, as devotees in Srila Prabhupada's line, right, we should take everything Srila Prabhupada um, has said literally as it is, isn't it? As per written by the scriptures. Because I do see that, um, like, Shastras, like, you know, Gita, Bhagavadam and everything, we see devotees giving um, commentaries and um, opinions where Prabhupada has stated clearly certain things, statements are made. So my question is, should our mood be such that we take everything Srila Prabhupada says literally as far as the scriptural translations and purports that are given? I mean, he can say different things in probably personal letters and um, um, conversations maybe, but the scriptural purports and translations, should it be taken literally as it is? Yes. Yasya Devi Parabhakti Dita Devi Guru. We should accept the teachings of the spiritual teachers along with the teaching of the Supreme Law. Whatever Krishna has spoken in the Bhagavad Gita, we accept. And we accept whatever the spiritual teachers have passed on to us, their realizations of the absolute truth based on scriptures. Yeah, we believe all. We don't have to doubt that. We see everything becoming true. Just like people used to think that when you sterilize something, you kill all the forms of life. You know, that was originally the system of sterilization. You put it in the flame, and you hate, and they say everything will die, all the germs will die. But now they know that when you heat some, not everything dies. There are different things which live in the heat, they don't die. And it doesn't matter how hot or how cold you make something, there are, death, there are certain forms of life which will live. Just like opium. Opium is a poison, but within opium there are worms which live, and they, they, they live in the opium. And so for us, we cannot understand how anything could live in opium, but there are forms of life living there. And you get creatures which live in stone, and they can eat marble. They live in the marble, and they eat the marble. And so we, we're not aware of all these things. We wonder how is it all possible. But it, it happens. You've got the, those creatures up in Ganduki who are making Shaligram Shilas. They're carving the different Vishnu Shaligrams, the different forms of Lord Vishnu and the different stones there in the Ganduki River. You know, we wonder how is it possible. But the proof is there. You can see the shaligrams. You see the different forms of shaligram. The Lord appears in these different shaligrams. How did how does the Lord appear? That these insects they carve the Lord there into these different stones. So there's so many things we don't know. But if we have faith in the words of Krishna and Guru, then everything is revealed. So yeah, we should hear with faith. Okay, we'll stop here. Thank you. Hare Krishna.